appreciate all of your prayers for the success of our uh, upcoming program as we transition from the Living University to the Living Education. And uh, we're updating every week in the bulletin uh, bits and pieces of it, but hopefully it'll, it, it clarifies little by little as we go forward as to what it's all about and uh, what, what we're going to do. <clears throat> so I think as was mentioned in the, uh, in the announcements briefly, <clears throat> excuse me, right now we have for our on, uh, on-site program, we have about uh, half of the students that we're, we're looking for and we're heavy on the girls, which is, uh, th that's not a nice thing to say about girls. I shouldn't say that. We're, we're, we have plenty of girls and we're a little bit short on the guys right now. We have one, one gentleman and six or seven or eight or, or 10, I forget how many now, uh, girls, which is fine for the guy. I mean, I think that personally, you know, if I were a young man, I say, this is perfect. It doesn't get any better than this. But um, he might like to have some company, and it might be hard uh, when we do the dances, you know, is going from one to the next, to the next, to the next. It might get worn out by the time, you know, after a year, it'll be like five years in terms of, you know, dating years, if that's, if that's, if there's such a thing like that. So um, we're looking for, for more young men, and um, I think particularly because, uh, because we are making it very clear this is a one-year uh, investment in, in, in life, really. And uh, I, I hope that young guys will really consider the fact that uh, nine months, actually it's not even a, a year, but nine months is uh, <clears throat> in terms of a, of a lifetime of learning and a lifetime of, 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 of career activity and working. Uh, nine months, go, a month goes pretty fast. And so with a, with a dedication of that period of time, I think we can make uh, quite a dent in, uh, in helping uh, young men and young women to be able to prepare for the future. Uh, with the online program, right now we're, I believe, 130 or 40 uh, that have, have registered to be part of it, and uh, so that, that number is, is growing, and we'll, we'll give more details as we approach our starting date, which is August uh, 15th, I believe, mid-August. Mid <clears throat> in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, We have a statement, it's a very familiar statement to us. I think that when you say it, you'll, you'll recognize this is something that is, it's ingrained in, in us. We, it's part of our, our, our sort of our, our culture, our, our, our thinking in terms of the way we live our life. We refer to it many times. We have a statement, a simple statement. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ, Paul said. Or follow me, or be you followers, followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. When, as it says in the King James, when, when we read this verse, the, the message cannot be more clear. Paul taught the importance of being a follower, an imitator of Christ. But that's not a popular message in our culture. You know, if you go to the local bookstore, you'll find lots and lots and lots and lots of books on leadership, but very few on the importance of followership. If you go to Amazon Online Books, you don't have to do it right now if you have your phone handy, but if you would go to Amazon Books and you do a little online search and you type in leadership, guess how many books you'll find? Well, more than, you won't even come up exactly how many, it says more than 30,000. On the other hand, type in followership on Amazon Books, what do you think the number will be? It's 173. Quite a difference, quite a contrast in what, what attracts our attention. You know, John Maxwell alone has written 71 books on leadership of one sort or another, everything from Developing the Leader Within You, which sold more than a million copies, to How Successful People Think, Lunch, and Learn. I'm not sure how many copies he, he sold of that one, but you can get it for $19.99 on Amazon if you wish. He's sold altogether 25 million books about leadership, and he's called America's number one leadership authority, according to his, his bio on, on Amazon. Here's a quote. His organizations have trained more than 5 million leaders in 188 countries. But with all the talk about leadership, there's something missing. 
You see, learning leadership is, is great, but you know what they say about leaders without followers? Well, he who thinks he leads but has no followers is only taking a walk. So you can, all, you can learn all the indispensable laws of leadership, as one of Maxwell's books is titled, but without followers, you're like a, a one-handed clap. Not much happens, does it? See, followers provide the horsepower. Good followers multiply the vision. Good followers multiply the impact. Good f- followers multi- multiply the power of good leaders. And most of us spend as much time, if not more, following compared to leading, don't we, in reality. So let's face this issue head on. We're told here by Paul we need to be followers, followers of him, as he says specifically here. And let's, let's focus on followership, the forgotten side of leadership. Followership the forgotten side of leadership. Now first, why is being a good follower even important? We read a scripture here, but why why is it more important? Let me prove my point a little bit more. Let's go to Matthew chapter four, Matthew chapter four. Matthew chapter four, and we begin reading here in verse 18 as we read of Christ beginning his ministry. And as he does, look what happens. Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea. They were the first ones who practiced networking, by the way. Um, That's a computer joke, by the way, if you didn't get it. Uh, So some of you are are really with me with the computer stuff, you know, but um, networking, get it. Okay, anyway, forget it. Just forget it. Let me go back. It says, they were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets, and they followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left the boat and their their father and followed him. Let's flip over to Mark chapter 2 and read about some more of the disciples who became, literally, followers of Christ. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and we read verse 13, Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him. Mark 2, verse 13, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And so he arose and followed him. The story goes on from there. Let's flip over to John, the Gospel of John. John chapter 1, by this time, it's not a mystery what we're going to find. John chapter 1. We read, we're going to break into the section here. One of the two, verse 40, John chapter 1. And verse 40, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And then he brought him to Christ. And when Jesus looked at him, he said, you are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Then we come to verse 43. The following day, Jesus wanted to to go to Galilee, and he found Philip. And he said to him, follow me. Now, not to belabor the point, but they were chosen to be leaders, not because of their credentials as leaders, right? It's pretty clear. They were doing different things. What thread can you find that tied them together? Well, it's it's pretty obvious, isn't it? The one thing that we see they had in common, and the little that we've read at this point, is they had a willingness to follow a willingness to follow. Why is it important to be a good follower? Number one, the first reason is this. A willingness to be a follower is the absolute starting point for being part of God's team. If we are not willing to follow, we don't even begin the journey. There are actually two rules of, of leadership. Their first one is to show up. 
you have to be there, right? Everybody wants to be a leader. If you don't show up, nothing happens. All the, everything else doesn't happen. You have to show up. Number two is you have to be willing to follow. You have to be willing to follow. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, and we read the, 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 the contrast here. Luke chapter 9, and we begin reading verse 57. Here we read about another man who is a, well, I'll say potential, <laughs> because that's all that turned out to be. A potential disciple of Christ. He says, verse 57, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Recognize that a, a willingness to follow was, was important and was sort of willing to follow. Okay, as we go through the story, Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. In other words, following has to be, a willingness to follow has to be more than just lip service. It, it has to be action. And so a common thread here, a lack of a true willingness to follow, right? So a willingness to be a follower is the absolute starting point for being part of God's team. A willingness to follow is, is akin to a willingness to learn, isn't it? I mean, they had to be disciples or learners. If you look at the Greek meaning of, 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 uh, of the, the word, the, the English meaning of the Greek word that's used for disciples, it, it means at its root, learners, uh, learners. So willingness to follow is akin to be a willingness to learn, and they had to be disciples before they could be apostles. There are some people who are very focused on being in front. They're, they want to be in front, and they're not nearly as interested in supporting the successes, the agenda, the missions, uh, mission of others. You ever notice people who are very excited about an activity that they're responsible for, but they, they're not interested in activities that other people are responsible for? It's a sad fact. I don't mean to step on anybody's toes, but let's, let's, let's face it. When it's our activity, we'll be there. If it's not ours, we do not rate it as highly important. And we think whether it will be convenient, whether it will fit within what we want to do. But a true follower of, let's say in this case, Christ, the church, is going to be part of not just their own agenda, but part of the bigger picture of what's happening. So when Christ works with people, when God works with people, he demands a willingness to follow. Let's go to Nehemiah chapter 9. Maybe we see this scattered throughout the Bible again and again and again. In fact, if you, if you look up the word leadership in the Bible, you won't find it. it doesn't, it's not there. Now granted, it's not completely fair to say because followership is not there either, okay? But you find all kinds of words that actually lend themselves to leadership, but they're very specific. Father, priest, king, uh, uh, pastor, servant. You find lots of words that delineate very specific actions and roles. But what you find in terms of, of followership is you find this, this broad emphasis on following that is at page after page after page after page. Here's an example. Nehemiah chapter, chapter 9. We find Nehemiah chapter 9 where he's, he's actually rehearsing the journey of their forebears, Nehemiah chapter 9, and I wanted to begin here in verse, uh, verse, verse 18. I'm not going to go through the whole, the, the whole uh, section, but um, he says in verse 18, Even when they made a molded calves, calf for themselves and said, This is your God that brought you up out of Egypt and worked great, provo and worked great provocations, yet in your manifold mercies you do not forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road, nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light and the way they should go. In other words, the leadership we find by and large 
from one end of the Bible to the other is the leadership of God. It, that's what's pointed to. And if they were not, in this case, if the Israelites were not willing to follow the lead of God, they would not survive. There was no other op option offered. There was no other option. They had to be willing to follow if they were going to survive. You know, so often we want other options. Now, again, remember, we're talking here about why this is important. And I emphasize again, a willingness to follow is a starting point for being part of God's team and being a leader, ultimately being a leader. And I, so, as I said, we, you know, we, want, we want options sometimes. Um, sometimes we want to be a follower when we agree. That, that's easy to do. But when we don't agree, it's a little bit different. Or it's not exactly what we'd like to do, it's a little bit different. I find, um, sadly, sometimes this is the response for, for folks we bump into who, who contact, contact us as, as go-tos, as prospective members. How many times I've heard, some of you who interact with, with new prospective members, how many times you hear, oh, it's great to find someone who agrees with what I believe, finally. I'm so glad you agree with me. I want a fellowship with you. And I, I, sort, of, I sort of cringe. My heart sinks a little bit because inevitably, unless that thinking changes, and unfortunately all too often it doesn't change, unless that thinking changes, I know they won't be with us long because, because of the mentality. In other words, it just happens that we're on the same path at this moment. Okay, We just happen to be walking the same path. It's like walking down the road with somebody, you know, you, you, you walk together with them and until their journey goes somewhere else, and you're just the same place at the same time. And that's all it is, unfortunately. And the importance of this willingness to follow is never going to change, brethren. Let's go to Revelation chapter 14. Let's go to the end of the book. Revelation chapter 14. We read about, let's say, the end of the story, breaking into the whole section here. I want to focus specifically on just how this word pops up again. So we go to verse 4. We read, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are the ones, and what does it say? These are the ones who follow, as we read, these are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Is there a time where, where, when following is not going to be important? There's a second reason why being a good follower is important, and that's this. I'll just go ahead and, and say it straight out. If we show a pattern, then, of following well, we show a preparation for a pattern of leading well. Now, I'm going to give you an example here. Let's go to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to look at the example of, just a quick example here, of, of Joshua. Now, Joshua followed Moses for, what, 40-plus years before he led the children of Israel into the Promised Land. And as far as examples of, of followers, it's hard, to, it's hard to beat, at least in this section of the Bible, the example of, of, of Joshua. It's hard to top the example of Joshua. Exodus chapter 17. We're going to flip through a number and just hit some, uh, some points here. Exodus 17 and verse uh, eight. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, and Moses said to Joshua, by, this, by the way, this is the first time Joshua's name is mentioned here in the Old Testament. He said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So we see Moses instructing Joshua, and he did as he was instructed. We flip forward a few chapters, Exodus 24. Exodus 24. And verse 13, Exodus 24, verse 13. So Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, his follower, the one who did what he said, one who helped him, who, who, who followed his, his instructions. He says, verse 14, Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and then Moses went up to the mountain of God. Flipping forward, Exodus 32. As you can see, I'm just going to cherry pick down through history here, down through the, the timeline, Exodus 32. And verse 17, when Joshua heard the noise of the people of the gold calf, because he was with Moses, following him, assisting him. So he wasn't, he wasn't doing his own thing. He was doing what he could to, to follow and assist uh, Moses. Exodus 
uh, 33, verse 11, next time his name is mentioned, it says, So the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend, and he would return to the camp. But his servant jo Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. So we go on. I mean, you can read. I have a, a list of scriptures here, but you can look up. Just look up every time Joshua's name occurs before the book of Joshua, and you're going to see examples of him following Moses for 40 plus years. Now, how did this pattern of following, well, to my point, I said again, if we show a pattern of following well, we show a preparation for leading well. How do I know that? Because we see it time and time again. Here's an example. Let's go to Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. We see what kind of man Joshua became as a leader after 40 years of, a, of willingness to follow. Joshua chapter 1, after the death of Moses, we read here, after the death of Moses, a servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel. And he goes from there. He, God selects Joshua specifically and says, I want you to do this job. He knew he knew, and the people knew Joshua. He had credibility. Nobody was, would question, when he was given the mantle of responsibility, nobody would question his credibility. No one would question his experience, would they? No one would question his, his example. His example from his days of following translated into effectiveness as a leader. And no one would, would, would question his competence. And in reality, these are actually four characteristics that we always measure when we look towards having someone stand up in the front of the congregation to lead or take a responsibility, aren't they? Competence, credibility, example. These are things that, we, that, that come to bear. If a person doesn't have credibility, experience, example, or competence, then you can't use them as a, as a, as a leader. But they're shown first through, through following, through followership. So let's go to the end of this, of this book, Joshua 24, because his impact as a leader is arguably one of the most profound in the history of the people of, of Israel. Joshua 24, we read the end of the story of Joshua's life. You can read of his courage. You can read of how he led Israel. That's not my point today. I'm just trying to bring him to mind as an example for you. And we see in Joshua 24 now, some very powerful words. It's, it's a, a wonderful epithet for, for a man, for a leader. He says, verse 29, It came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him within the border of his inheritance at Timnath Sarah, which is in the mountains of Ephraim on the north side of Mount Gash. Look what it says in verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had known all the works of the Lord, which he had done for Israel. Did Joshua have a part in the faithfulness of, of Israel? You better believe it. As a powerful tool that God used. But he was willing to follow for 40 years. Now, I hope that gives you just a couple of reasons, and we could talk about more, but giving you a couple of reasons to try to prove the importance of, of followership because God is looking for followers to train to be leaders in the right way and the right time. Now, to, to understa understand ourselves then as followers, let's move forward a little bit and, and then and dig into this topic. To understand ourselves as followers and to understand if we're a leader, those we lead, when we lead, you know, it's helpful to analyze the broad types of, of followers. And to do so, I'm going to, I'm going to need your help. Now, you just have to sit here. You don't have to do anything. Just stay where you are, okay? So, but I'm going to talk about you. I'm going to talk about you um, as four quadrants of people, four types of, of people. Now, you can replicate this on your paper if you'd like to. If you just draw a square... Let's draw a square and divide it into four quadrants. In this case, we have four quadrants in the room. We have that corner, we have this corner, we have this corner to my, to my stage left, and then 
back over there. So we have four, four, four quadrants, okay? And we're going to look at different types of followers that have been analyzed and look at some examples in the Bible of how people fit, fit into this. And this is actually something that um, different people have studied. Robert, uh, Robert Kelly is a, uh, someone whose name you might bump into if you look up on the web, you look up followership, and you see patterns that have developed. And there are different patterns like any of these things, but we're going we're gonna to look at what, the pattern that he proposes here, here today. So the first type of, of a follower is those folks back in that corner of the room. Okay? Those, those folks back there, if you're back in here, because you are passive followers, okay? Sorry about that, but you're passive followers, okay? <laughs> passive followers. Now, passive dependent. Now, passive followers like you, um, you, you represent, thankfully, the lowest percentage of of uh, these types of followers in a typical organization. Between five to 10% of followers are passive followers. If you wanna put on your, in your little square on your page, just put the, the, the bottom left-hand corner, I'm flipping it around for your purposes here, the bottom left-hand corner, just write in passive followers. Now, a passive follower lacks initiative. Um, a passive follower lacks a sense of responsibility or obligation. A passive follower requires constant direction. A passive follower looks to the leader to do their thinking for them, and they don't have much desire to improve themselves or improve the organization. They support the status quo by simply doing as little as possible. Thank you for your contribution, but um, <laughs> It's not a lot, okay? Now, they're, they're compliant, so the, the beauty of, of passive followers is they don't make trouble. They don't make anything. They're there, they're warm bodies, but, and they don't make trouble. And the thing is, to a leader, some leaders love passive followers because they don't ask them questions. Of course, they don't do anything else, but they're easy to manage because they're, they're passive, they're compliant. They're, they're disengaged, but they're not hostile. They're just there. Now, this, this gentleman, Kelly, there's a, one statement about his research, and it says that his, his research shows that passive followers are, in actual fact, responding to the leader's expectations of them. Often followers in churches and nonprofit organizations are passive simply because the pastor or leader does not expect anything of them. The leader is quite happy to do everything themselves and to be the lone charismatic superstar who single-handedly brings about, about the much needed transformational change. They forget that leaders only bring about, at best, about 20% 20, 20 of any change. Followers do the rest. It's followers working with a leader that actually produce work and growth and change. No leader can do it by themselves. But some leaders, they're happy with this. Now let's go to Matthew chapter 13, because I want to show you an example. How does this, how does this uh, bear in terms of something we read in the scriptures? Perhaps in your own mind, this may be familiar terror to you. You may think, oh, I know someone like that. We all know someone like those things, don't we? Whenever we find an example, we all know someone like that. <laughs> so, so someone, I should say someone like that over there, okay? <laughs> so that quadrant over, over there, Matthew chapter 13. Thanks for being the good sports folks over there. Actually, if we were, too, if we were super accurate, it would be only, what did I say, uh, 5, 10, 15%. So it would actually just be those way in the back. Well, that's not very nice either, is it? That's very specific, sorry. That makes it even more embarrassing. Matthew chapter 13, Matthew 13, and we read a parable, the parable of the sower and the seed. I'm going to jump to the explanation of it, verse 18. Therefore, Christ said, hear the parable of the sower, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. But here's the second type is like the passive follower. He who received the seed on stony places, see who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, it's happy, 
feels, I want to be part of things. Sometimes it's finding a place to feel like you fit in. Sometimes we have people who come our way, and because we're friendly, because we're, we reach out and we're happy, it's a, it's a nice, comfortable, pleasant home. But there's, there's really no engagement or willingness to change. Or when, and when something comes along that cuts crossways with what a person like that wants to do or, or believes, well, that's a different story. But as long as they have a comfortable place to socialize, they're real happy. You see, but as we see here, he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word, immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, endures only for a while, for when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word. When, 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 it's, when it becomes difficult, when it becomes uncomfortable, as long as it's comfortable, they're there. But when it's not comfortable, immediately he, he stumbles. They'll go along with things as long as they don't have to change too much. But the commitment level is minimum, is minimal. This could be the kid who grows up in the church and just coasts along. When they get to be of age and start, and start uh, uh, becoming a, an older teenager, a young adult, you know, they're comfortable, but there's no sense of commitment. They haven't grasped the vision they're not convicted about the vision. They're, they're comfortable, and they float along. And at some point, they're challenged. And they begin to have to make a decision. We, then we see how God is working or not with them, and that's, that's something that's on an individual basis. But, but it can be, can be someone who's, as I say, grows up in the church and just is there. Those of you who are young, you know what I'm talking about, because there's somebody who is here comfortable. They, they show up at church every week, but you know as well as I, they don't believe in what we teach. And if you believe in what we're about, if you believe in what we teach and believe in or are convicted in, you know it because you hear what they talk about. You hear what goes through their, their, what you, what goes through their mind. You know what they're doing with their time on the computer, and you know now, they're comfortable here, but they're not really, truly with the program. They're passive, but that's not just kids. It's not just young people. It's also adults, isn't it? It's also adults. We can be happy and, and feel no obligation. I, you, know, you might say, well, I'm not passive. I mean, I, I talk or whatever else. But what I'm saying is this is someone who feels no obligation or no sense of responsibility or duty to anyone else in the congregation. So therefore, they can come at the last minute, leave as soon as the last, as, as the amen, because what? Who cares? I have no obligation to anybody else. I'm here. I did my time. I sat in a pew. That's a passive follower, not recognizing that any sense of obligation to anyone else in the congregation. But that's not, that's not the way God's church, the body of Christ works. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, because you know, guess what? This is the classic Laodicean Characteristic, isn't it? It's going with the flow. Revelation 3, you, you know what it's going to say even before we get there, but let me draw your attention to it because it so, it, it so closely fits this, this uh, uh, characterization of a type of follower. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 14 and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, will vomit you out of my mouth. You say, I'm rich, have become wealthy, have need of nothing. It's a, it's a passive mindset. And, and not only... don't. Don't get caught up in the have need of nothing. There's a mentality behind that. There's a mentality behind that, isn't there? I have need of nothing. What is, I don't, it's not do I have need of nothing, but where is the thought? For a person to say I have need of nothing, where are their thoughts? On themselves. What about the person sitting next to them? Do they have need of something? It's not even, it hasn't even entered their mind. We can sometimes focus on the, 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 the wealthy part or the I have lots, but we're, there's, a, there's a, a more fundamental layer. It's like, I don't care about anybody else. I is how it begins. 
So, so this is a person who is truly passive in terms of, of, of their followership. There's not a care for anybody else. And he says, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be truly rich. In other words, character that is refined through action and application of a godly way of life. I'm adding a lot to that, but that's what we're talking about. That's what he's referring to. In white garments, righteousness, that always impacts other people. How do you love without another person? How are you patient without another person? How, are we, how do we suffer long without another individual? It's, it's passiveness does not has, does not engage or care to engage or have any sense of responsibility towards anyone else. So he says, um, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. You know, in Exodus chapter 4, in Exodus chapter 4, we can, I want to go here real, real quickly, I'll just give you one more example here in terms of an individual. And that is Moses, because at this point in time, Moses was acting like a passive follower when God called him. Now, there's, there's a point to this as well, underlying point, that's God is merciful. And sometimes we, we take on a type of followership that is, is not good, and God's, God's merciful, and he, and he helps us. Here's a, a good example, because Moses ultimately led Israel with great power and... and uh, was, is highly commended for who he was. But at this point, this was not showing his best side. And, and so we see elements of the passive follower as God is beginning to, to, to call him. If you look at uh, here, verse, how shall we begin here? He said, God introduces himself, and I've, he says in verse 7, I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. So therefore, he says, verse 10, Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And what does Moses say? Who am I? Um, I you got the wrong guy here. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Now, who was, talking, who was, he, who was he being addressed by? God. So, you know, it's like a, a kid saying to his parent, you know, have you ever had uh, a parent, you say to your, your, your son or your daughter, let's say your son, say, look, can you please pick up that box and go put it in the kitchen? I, you think I'm really strong enough to do that? I just don't know. No, I wouldn't have asked you if I didn't know you were strong enough to do it, but are you sure? Because that's a lot of weight in that cardboard box. I know it's only this big, but still, it's a heavy cardboard box. Now, I, I'm, maybe I'm characterizing Moses incorrectly, but God was speaking to him, and he was arguing with God about his ability to do this job. What is he saying? I, I don't want to be engaged. I don't, I don't think so. I'm comfortable here, and so let me be. And he says, I will certainly be with you. Verse 13, Moses said to God, Well, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What am I going to tell them? You know, as you go through the account, I'm not going to go through every last, you know, uh, confrontation here or response, but, but Moses in this case is acting like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. I don't know, you know, I just don't know if I can do that. You know, it's like Eeyore, it's, it's this, oh, everything's bad and I can't do it and I don't, that's, Moses is Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh at, the, at, this, at this point. But... The question then is, okay, we've, you've seen this, how these people are over here. Okay, passive follower, let, let's continue moving. But, but there must be some remedy, right? How, how to improve as a follower? If you step back and say, I, this is me. I don't, I don't want to be like this. What do, you, what do you do? What do you do? Well, we read back in Revelation chapter 3, what was, the, what was the antidote? What was the antidote? We recognize this in ourselves and we want to change. Revelation chapter 3, quickly go back to it and look at what it says, it says, verse 19, back, actually before that, he says, there's, there's a sense of, of, of buying, of anointing the eyes, and accepting rebuke, verse 19, and then being zealous and repenting. So there's their action. Get stirred up. Engage. 
engage. Actually work up some through God's help. Ask God to give you the love, the concern, the sense of obligation to your fellow brethren. And then just simply reach out and say, hi, what's your name? Or reach out and say, hey, you know what? I'm, I noticed you weren't looking like you're, you're feeling so well. What's up? Care. Instead of saying, hmm, something, they must, something that might, 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 must not be right, but I'm not sure. When we have activities, the best of our ability, come, be part of it. Sometimes just showing up, even if you don't feel like it, it helps to just be there. Sometimes you drag ourselves to an activity. I know when you have any of the activities Mr. DeSimo was mentioning, the ones who are responsible for parts of the, lead, of the organization, they're going to be there. <laughs> but, but those who are not, you know, we, we give it a second thought, don't we? Do we really have time? I think of all the other things I could do. I could watch TV, you know. I could eat food. I mean, I could, in other words, we think of all the things we could do. But, but when, we, when, when we don't work ourselves, but just we drag ourselves to engage with other people. And what happens is the opportunities to show love and show concern and care then begin to emerge. They begin to emerge. So be stirred up. And Galatians chapter 6, I don't want to spend any more time on this quadrant. It's only 5 or 10% here, but I'm taking way too much time. Galatians chapter 6, uh, I'll just point you to verses 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. It, it talks about being your brother's keeper. In other words, that, that mentality of being your brother's keeper is, as that's, as that's developed, our mind changes. For leaders, as a leader in working with Passive followers, give them a job. I already mentioned, I gave this hint a number of times. If you haven't gotten it yet, then uh, you've been, you haven't been listening. For pa- if, you have, if, if you're concerned about passive followers, give them a job. When you give them a job, guess what? We feel and are needed, useful. And we, beca- we come out of our shell. Sometimes we're passive because we don't know what to do. We want to do something, we don't know what to do. And so we just sort of settle back. Well, that's partly the part of leaders to actually be willing to to give a job, give a responsibility, share that load a little bit, and make it meaningful. And what happens is then we're brought out of our shell. Passive followers need a very strong incentive from the leader. They need to be given responsibility and empowered, given the, 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 the ability, given the skills, given the materials to be able to undertake tasks before they'll get engaged. It's not fair as a leader to demand that passive followers get involved when they don't know what to do and then berate them when they don't do anything. It's not fair. It's not fair. Give them direction. Give them an opportunity. Say, here's what I'd like you to do. And many times passive followers can, will, will come along and become engaged. Okay, let's go to the next, next uh, group here. <clears throat> This is the, the folks over back in here, this side here, okay? This corner of the, of the room. Now, you over here, you are, are conformist followers, okay? Conformist followers. Over here is passive, you're conform, conformist. Now, you're, you're more active than there. There are people over here passive. You're more active, but you're, you don't think much for yourself, okay? You're yes people. Sorry, I'm just using this generally, okay? But you're, you're yes people, you'll go along, you don't really think about what you're being asked to do. You don't think critically, I mean critically in a positive way, carefully about uh, what, you, what you're doing. And, and this can be fine at times, sometimes we just have to do what we're told to do. But, you know, it can also, if we don't ever think about what we're told to do, we never actually suggest a better way or suggest a modification or suggest, we, in other words, we just do, we actually, prevent sometimes growth or improvement. So um, if we say, well, that's the way the pastor said to do it, and that's the way I'm going to do it, I don't care that the situation has changed and everything is different. I'm going to do it this way. He said, set up the chairs facing that way. And I don't, even though the lectern is not over there anymore, it's over here, that's the way the chairs are supposed to be set up. And that's what he said. So don't get in my way. I'm setting up the chairs that way. Now, we laugh because it's an exaggeration, but we all know it happens sometimes. We get so locked into conforming to something we've been told to do that we don't actually think, hold on a second. Is, are, are we sure the leader still wants us to do it this way? <laughs> because actually, things have changed a little bit. Let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 11. This type of follower can seem to excel in a team because they do what they're told to do at whatever the cost, sometimes even running over other people. Sometimes conformists end up 
leaving dead bodies in their wake because they're conforming to what they thought was supposed to be done. Not good. Not good. But, but that's, that happens. This type of follower may find it difficult to say no. This type, when they need to, they need to say, I can't take on any more responsibility, for example. I, I can't do any more. Um, or this, you don't, maybe the situation is not as you understand it to the leader. Clarify things. Oh, oh in that case, I don't want you to do that. I want you to do this. But they won't do that. They just conform because they're, they're not thinking. They're, they're, they're active, but they're not, they have, they're not critical in their, in their thinking, careful in their thinking. And they always say what they think the leader wants to hear, which is a dangerous mix as well. 2 Samuel and chapter 11, give you an example of this. 2 Samuel chapter 11. And we read in verse 14. Now this is after the, or, or actually it's, it's right in the middle of the incident with uh, David and Bathsheba. And we're going to focus on, on Joab. Because Joab fits the bill in this situation. He, he conformed to what he was told to do without ever once blinking. And we see verse 14. In the morning it happened that David wrote a, a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck down and die. And so it was, while Joab besieged the city, that he assigned Uriah to a place where he knew there were valiant men, and the men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the people of the servants of David fell, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Can you imagine what it would have been like, not just for Uriah, as he sees men who were commanded to withdraw from him by Joab, talk about being a conformist to what the boss wanted, yet David was a man who we see at times when he was, he was shaken, in fact, Another time, Joab, I think it's interesting, because later in his life when David demanded a census, Joab said, no, it's the wrong thing to do. And I, maybe he learned from this, and he said, never again will I do something. And he had other problems as, as well, but I mean, he did. In that case, he stood up and said, David, this is not right. But not in this case. And he allowed one of his mighty men, Uriah was a, one of the mighty men, and he allowed him to be left in battle in the heat of the battle. What a horrible, disloyal, absolutely, as far as a, a, a commander in arms, just a, an abs, absolutely horrible thing to, to do. What do you think that did to the morale of the men? Well, as you read the story of David, you see, because we see some examples of how it, this type of, 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 in fact, I think this is one of the, you might say, the elements that led to uh, fracturing in David's leadership. I mean, that, I think we can analyze that going through the book, but certainly back to Joab, we see someone who is a conformist. He carried out orders without thought. Um, David instructed Joab to have Uriah killed. Joab didn't question it. And in fact, as we see here beginning in verse 18, he, he gave a detailed report of the murder. He went into detail as how it happened. Despite the repercussions, Joab was, was you know, he, was, he would have been able to say no to the king and uphold his integrity, but instead he, he chose not to. So we see some other examples here in the scriptures. I'll, I'll look at, um, I've got two. Let's go, to, let's go to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5. One example of a, a, a conformer follower is, um, is the example of Ananias and Sapphira. And, and the other I have here, I'm not sure we're going to get to it, but, and that is in Galatians 2, where Peter, he became a conformist. When he, in a sense, put himself under the leadership of the, of the men, who, that he, his companions at the time, and, and then left the Gentiles and that was, I think that's another example we can point to it. But let, let's just look at this one in Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5, a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, we don't get much of the, uh, the 
precursor to this story specifically for Ananias and Sapphira, but if we read <clears throat> in the preceding verses, we can see the atmosphere. We can see what was happening in the church at this time. And there was this clearly this, uh, this desire for people to share and to help out, and even the leadership was admonishing uh, people to care for one another. Okay, you can read this here in the, in, starting in Acts chapter 2, and into 3 in particular, coming down through this point in, in time. But, but what we find here is that they wanted to look good. They wanted to be, they were active in doing so. They weren't passive. They were active in conforming to what they thought looked good, but obviously under the surface here, there was something more going on. So he kept back, verse 2, part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. He wanted to look good to the apostles. And he wanted to conform. But Peter said, Ananias... Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? So we see it was a, it was a show to look good to the, to the leaders. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your control? In other words, you had the, you had the right to do with it what you, what you wish, but what you did was to appear a certain way before us and, and others. He said, you have not lied to men, but to God. And then, of course, Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his, his last. So, how to improve as a, a follower if we find ourselves in the, the quadrant of the conformers, okay? What, do we, what should we do? We ask ourselves, ah, boy, this, this sounds like me a little bit. I don't want to be this way. What do we do? Well, recognize that we can be a better follower if we do exercise, I'll say, critical thinking in the positive way. Careful thinking. Critical thinking in the proper way. Careful thought. Speak up respectfully and appropriately if we have a suggestion or concern. To clarify what we're being asked to do. To clarify what the mission is, what the purpose is. So we, we, we're doing things not just because, to, to please our boss, our leader, but because we want to do what's best. And so we do it appropriately, carefully, but frankly, this is what a good leader really wants and needs, right? A good leader wants appropriate input. And if they're on the wrong track, they want to be able to say, hold on a second, oh, that's not what I intended. We had, I'll just say we had a situation this, this last week in the office where that was borne out. A decision was made by Mr. Weston, uh, in terms of uh, employment and some things happening during the summer, in terms of uh, working with students. And, and he was willing, after consideration, after a, another point was brought up, he was willing to say, oh, that wasn't the best idea, let's change course. It didn't, didn't bother him to do that when some other information was brought to bear. I mean, that, that's reasonable, that's appropriate, that's, that's, a, you know, that, that's a, a good leader wants good input. So, as a follower, we should not be afraid to properly, appropriately speak up. Um, for leaders, recognize that it's not insubordination for our followers to ask for clarity or even disagree with our ideas. I mean, ultimately, they have to be willing to cooperate at the end of the day, but, but as a leader, be willing to recognize it's not insubordinate, insubordination uh, if it's done appropriately. Now let's go to the next characteristic here. Now, we've got two more to, to review. This characteristic is, is the folks over here in this, in this corner, okay? So we've gone from the passive followers to the conformist followers. You know, the, these people are not very active, not thinking a lot, okay? <laughs> very passive, okay? Um, these people over here, uh, they are... Um, they're conforming, they're thinking a lot, but, um, uh, but they're just conforming anyway. Now, we come to the, the corner up, up here, okay? The corner up here is a little bit different again. Let's go down to, um, where shall we begin here? Let's go to 2 Samuel 15, I think we'll go there. Now, the alienated follower, that's what we're talking about here, in other words, not just passive and not doing anything, but 
not real on board, but active, okay, active. In this case, the alienated follower um, has some positive characteristics. They're willing to be active. They want to get involved. They're problem solvers. They're doers. They can work with other people. Um, they think about the goals of the organization and the mission and all of that. And they're not hesitant to bring concerns to the leader. But what happens is this type of follower develops negative attributes. They actually become uh, critical, not constructive in their support, but become critical. They feel cut off from the team. They feel antagonistic because of discouragement, a lack of appreciation, feel their ideas are ignored. We have a classic example of that in, in 2 Samuel with Absalom, the story of Absalom. Now, did Absalom have legitimate gripes? Well, you better believe it, right? His, his, his sister was abused. A horrible, horrible situation. So it's not that there was, uh, there was not reason to have frustration and anger, but was it right to do what he did? We're just going to jump past the, the things that, ha that happened here with his sister, and we're going to go past the part where David seemed not to take really strong action, which you might say, well, that led to Absalom's behavior. Sometimes leaders have to make very difficult decisions in terms of action, how strong, what to do. But we, as followers, we have to, we have to be recognized that we have to take responsibility for our own responses to this. In this case, Absalom responded in a very wrong way. After this had happened, verse 1, that Absalom provided himself with chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. Now Absalom would rise early and stand beside the way to the gate, and so it was whenever anyone who had a lawsuit came to the king for a decision that Absalom would call to him and say, what city are you from? And he would say, your servant is from such and such a tribe of Israel. And then Absalom would say to him, look, your case is good and right, but there is no deputy of the king to hear you. And he would say, oh, oh, that I were made judge in the land and everyone who has any suit or cause would come to me and I would give him justice. In other words, Things just aren't right around here. I could fix it, but I'm not allowed to. This is an alienated follower, one who is active, not just sitting back. They're active, they're boiling, they're bitter, they're upset, they're angry. Absalom was a man of great promise, wasn't he? I mean, he was the son of a king, he was a great leader. And we see how he was able to rally the troops, even, as we see, even in his antagonism. This is why this, an alienated follower can be very influential. They're not passive, they're active. And they're thinkers. The problem is they're antagonistic. And, and it's, it's not, sometimes it's not without, you might say, cause, but the reality is the attitude has degenerated, deteriorated until, until they become a, a sore, they become a, a boil, they become an antagonism within the body, antagonists towards, um, towards the, the leadership, towards others who will not go along with them. So we see how the situation disintegrated here. Verse five, so it was whenever anyone came near to bow down to him, that he would put out his hand and take him and kiss him. And in this manner, Absalom acted toward all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. It's dangerous to be an alienated follower. You can do great, great damage. It's ironic that passive or conformist followers don't develop into alienated followers. You know who develops into alienated followers? It's this other quadrant right here. These are all the good people, by the way, the good followers, okay, over here. It's good followers who are active, who are willing to speak up, willing to, to offer, you know, even critique or whatever, but for one reason or another, they become discouraged, frustrated, angered, and they move over into this quadrant where they become alienated. This is a classic a case of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 13, where we read of the root of bitterness that can, that can grow. Now, how to improve as a follower if we find ourselves in this frame of mind? 
What, do we, what should we do? Well, f- first of all, be willing to accept the role in which our leader places us. Now, the apostles had to do this, didn't they? The apostles had to be, well, let's look, look at Matthew chapter 16. Matthew 16. Here we find an example of Peter's name mentioned. Matthew chapter 16, and I want to focus especially here just on the last couple of three verses of this section, where we read in verse 18, I also say to you, Christ said, that you are Peter. So Peter gets a a star status here in a sense. Okay, his name is mentioned. He's given a a particular responsibility of of leadership, of leadership. of, 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 of weight, he says, and on this rock, talking about himself, Christ is, of course, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. So they were all there, and they had to hear him give this extra weight to Peter. So they had to deal with the fact that he was given that extra weight. And, and he wasn't a perfect person either, was he? He, had, he made mistakes. And yet, here, this, this is the one, Peter's the one that's given this leading role, however you might define it. What am I talking about? In other words, we have to be able to accept the role in which our leader places us. Sometimes that changes. Sometimes it has to adapt. It has to morph one thing into another. But as a follower, we can't become alienated because of the role we're given or, or, or not given. Paul was called in place in a particular leading role later, wasn't he? That was, probably was not received well by a lot of people. We know some specifically that are mentioned. But what about the leadership? So consider the communication, secondly, as, to how to improve as a follower. Consider the communication that we have with our leader as, as someone who is feel slightly alienated. You know, we may have good ideas, and we may have honest criticism, but we may not be wisely considering the time, the place, and the manner in which we communicate those thoughts. It behooves us to adapt to our leader, not to expect the other way around. Matthew chapter 16, we just actually look at Just after this, I think it's ironic that just after this, look what happened. From the time that Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things, this is verse 21, from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised a third day, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. You just have to wonder if maybe a little bit of the big head began to happen with Peter, okay? But he says, verse 22, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, you are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Whoa! Talk about being cut down a bit. He was in for a a rude awakening, wasn't he? Now, what did he mean? He was confused as to why Christ would say bad things were going to happen to him. So, perhaps, in other words, if he would have said, more appropriately, Master, What are you talking about? I don't understand this. Why are you saying bad things are going to happen to you? I'm just saying. In other words, his he did what the way he expressed his concern was very inappropriate and was disrespectful, wasn't it? And and so Christ, that's why Christ responded the way he did, says, You're out of line. You're completely out of line. So my point is: consider how we how we approach our leaders. Consider how and continue to engage. Our leaders in areas of concern don't become embittered. What about for leaders in dealing with alienated followers? Well, you know, determine before God that you will truly listen to and truly encourage your followers, yours, ours. If we're in a position of leadership, you know, especially when they are at their when when they're not at their best, you know, because sometimes someone who's alienated just needs a listening ear. They need to be heard. They need to be, they need to be given some encouragement, and they'll come around. But we have to give them the chance. 
You know, even while correcting or giving feedback, be willing to give encouragement for areas they excel and areas they're doing well and, and, and that type of thing. You know, let, let, let followers feel like they're valued and that their work is appreciated and, and that they're part of the team. Because when someone doesn't feel like part of the team, that's when they become embittered and alienated. So, so make sure that we make, as a leader, you have responsi- you, me, the responsibility to not drive someone into an alienated place. Because in that, then we bear some of the responsibility for how they got there. Well, yes, we, they share responsibility for their actions. But we have to ask, what did we, did we place them there by how we treated that individual? So alienated followers are, are another component of followers. Let's look at the last one here then. Those folks over here then, okay, we have passive, conformists, alienated, and effective followers. Excellent. Uh, over, effective followers over here. Effective followers are active, but they're also independent thinking. They're able to be critical in an appropriate way. But they're active, they're engaged, they're problem solvers, they can work with others. They reflect on the goals of the organization. They internalize, they don't just go along with them, they think about those goals, they make them theirs. They don't just regurgitate the goals. They become the goals of the organization. I say the organization, I'm talking organization in the church. You know, this way of life becomes part of us. It's not just, well, and how, how many times I've heard, heard this said? Well, that's what the church says. You know, the pastor says this, the church says this. The church, what is the church? That's us. If you don't believe what the church says, then what are we here for? Okay. If we don't believe, the church doesn't say to keep the Sabbath day. We believe in keeping the Sabbath day, right? I mean, I would hope. But don't you hear it sometimes? Well, this is what the church says. And, and, and what happens is that we, we arms length those whatever it might be, that doctrine or, or what have you. But no, effective followers, they internalize. They are, are, are true believers. They're true believers. And the goals, the mission of, in this case, we're talking specifically of the church, of the body of Christ. Willing to follow, to commit, to take action, to engage, not passively sitting on the sidelines, but not just conforming without engaging their brains at, at all. They also might question the leader's actions or ideas in an appropriate way, but, but in a timely way. Galatians chapter 2, let's go to Galatians 2. I want to turn to Galatians 2 in this regard. Galatians chapter 2 and verse 11. I think Paul here fits in this category, in, in this example. He was willing to step up and address Peter concerning a fundamental issue here. But there was no question as to his conviction and his his, uh, dedication to the cause, right? He says, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? Who We who are Jews by nature, not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for the, by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. He used it, I'm not going to go through the whole, uh, uh, the whole dialogue here, but he used what he was describing is his willingness to actually to stand up and say, look, Peter, that's not right. Now, Peter, to his credit, as we go through the account, Peter did not somehow become embittered and angry. He took it, and we see that as, as the account goes on here through the, through the end of this, this time period in the church, what Paul was saying specifically was recognized, but his, uh, his willingness to stand up at an at, at a, at a important juncture and say, hold on a second, this is not right. And, um, and so that's, that's appropriate as a, an effective follower. But don't become alienated. Don't be, we don't become... A, uh, a, a, a critic on the sideline, 
We're engaged, but we want to simply express, look, um, this may be uh, a problematic if necessary. How to improve as an, an effective. Now, I, I mentioned some of the characteristics quite briefly. We're spending less time because you can see the opposite of some of the other characteristics. Engaged as opposed to disengaged. Um, not critical, but, I, but caring and, and wanting to, to help concerned about others, engaged with others, able to work with others, able to forward other people's goals, other people's activities and plans and efforts. That's what effective followers do because they know that someday they're going to be on the leading side and they would sure like other people to support what they're doing. So they, they're, they're recognizing that and they try, to, they try to be effective followers appropriately as well. So how to improve as a follower? Simply follow up on these characteristics. As a leader, do we foster this kind of follower? I'm going to give you one other example. In 1 Samuel chapter 19, we find uh, Jonathan was willing to confront his father Saul, um, and yet he was knocked down for it. Yet I think he showed an effective follower. He was looking, for the, the, looking out for the benefit of the whole, of the kingdom. And um, in, this case, in this case, he was, of course, cut down for it, but he had it really in Jonathan and in David, Saul had effective, courageous followers. That's another label you might find, effective slash courageous followers, if you look at some of the literature about this. There's a courage of this, this, in this type of follower. Um, they're willing to, be, uh, to, to, have, to, to go out on a limb, and they're, even if they might be out of they might sometimes have to be redirected. They're willing to be engaged, and that's, that's a good follower. Now, please note, none of us is 100% of any of these types, but we should all aspire to be consistently good, effective followers like the kind I've just highlighted last. But before I'm done, though, I need to highlight that there's another type of follower to bring up. Now, this is actually those sort of here in the middle. Now, I was pointing over here, and over here, and over here, and over here. And if you drew your box like that in four quadrants, you thought you had it all figured out, but you don't. Because if you draw a circle around the middle point here, you folks in the middle are sort of in the blurry area. Because you're pragmatic followers, which means that you shift according to the winds, <laughs> okay? And this is, these people are survivors, opportunists. And they're more concerned about surviving and getting ahead than followership integrity. And they sometimes, if they're around people who are alienated, guess how they act? To go along to get along. They act like that. When they're around people who are passive, they hang back. They don't want to stick, stick out too much. But when they're around a leader, boy, they're with the program. They're in there. Why? Not because they believe in it, because it's the thing to do. They're pragmatic followers. All of you right here. Be careful here. Um, let me to, we, we see Matthew chapter 26. And now here where Peter's going to get another label, and this is why I say these labels are, they're, they're broad strokes, but I hope you recognize the value. Matthew 26. The, the, these, this type of person is a chameleon. They're interested in their position on the team and their proximity to the leader, more so than the real goal and mission, what's best for the team, best for the leader, best for the, 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 the organization or the congregation as a, as a whole. Matthew 26, we see a contrast between Matthew 26 and, uh, and later on in John 18. Matthew 26 and verse 35, we read here, I'm going to be out of time shortly here, so let me just draw your attention to verses 31 through 35, where we read of Peter's, um, Peter's what can I say, his, his statement and his uh, bold pronouncement that he would stick with Christ through whatever. And you see verse 31, 32, Peter answered him, verse 33, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you this night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. We know it happened. Because over in John chapter 18, we read about a very different Peter, don't we? Not only did he not boldly stand up for Christ, he actually denounced him. I mean, quite a difference. It was a different setting. Now, 
You might think, oh, you're picking on Peter here. That's not fair. What I'm, the point is we, we can adopt different types of followership very, very easily. And, you know, the wonderful thing is that Christ was and is merciful because we see he was able to work with Peter and strengthen him to be firm, strengthen him to be consistent and, and stalwart as a follower. And, and so God is merciful. Christ is merciful, thankfully, with us. And, and we should be as leaders with those who are followers. You know, sometimes we can pigeonhole people, and because they're passive, we can say that's just a passive person or a conformist. And, what, and, and we're not willing then to try to encourage them and work with them so they can become a better follower. And, and uh, sometimes, actually many times, someone who may be in a certain category in our mind, actually in a different category, if we work with them a little bit differently, give a little more attention and time, ask God for help and work with them. You know, there are people who we have to literally ask God to give us love for that person because they really bug us, you know. <laughs> they really annoy us. We have to cry out to God and say, God, give me love because I don't have it. And I, I guess I'm going to have to talk louder. I guess my time is up because they, they cut the mic out on me. That was, uh, that's an interesting way to do it. No, I have two minutes. I have, so I, I'll just shout louder. Uh, so, so it's important. Now, there are other topics that we, could, that we could review. How do we become a better follower? Well, there are a lot of points that we could focus on for that. We'll save it for another day. But what are the results of thinking like a follower? You know, what are the results of thinking like a good follower? Because when we, when, we, when, we, when we conduct ourselves, when we think like a follower, there, are, there is a pattern that emerges. There's a result. And that bears on our, our leadership. Again, a topic for, for another day. So followership development may not be as popular as leadership development, but it's every bit as important. Now, when, when leading is mentioned in the scripture, whether it's Isaiah 11, where we read, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fat lean together, and a little child shall lead them, a picture of Christ leading Certainly nations, the, the nations of the world, if not you know, literally animals, but certainly we're taught where it's a picture of, of Christ. The Psalms are full of leadership, but the emphasis is on looking to God for leadership, particularly Psalm chapter 5 and verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Make your way straight before my face. Psalm 27. We read, teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Psalm 31, you are my rock and fortress, lead me and guide me. We can read psalm after psalm after psalm where the psalmist asks God to lead, to lead, to lead. So therefore, I can follow and follow and follow and then develop the ability to lead as God would, would lead. Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah came to the people and he said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, what did he say? Follow him. He said, if not, if it's Baal, well, follow him. And the people just stood there and answered not a word. That's what it says. They were not willing to follow. In Mark chapter 8, let's go up, let's conclude here. Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8 and verse 31. Or let's jump down to verse 34. We see, when he called the people, when Christ had called the people to himself with his disciples then, he said to them, whoever desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross. In other words, if you want to truly be part of my team, you have to not think of yourself first. You have to be willing to put others first, and you have to be willing to take responsibility Take obligation towards others. And then the final part of the, of the verse. And follow me. Follow Christ. Follow Christ with courage, with energy, with our whole heart. And we take that same approach, if we can take that same approach towards followership, with, with courage, with energy, with our whole heart, as we follow one another in daily life. 
as assigned and as established in the various roles in which we find ourselves, not alienated, not passive, and not conformist, just for conformity's sake, but energized, cooperative, wholehearted, with clear and, and, and curious minds engaged as an effective follower. Well, as we study the traits that we must take on for the future in doing so and, and becoming that follower that we should be, let's, and, and also the leader that we should be for today, but also for the future, let's not forget followership. The other side, the forgotten side of leadership.